Thank you. It is now time for a question period. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. My question is for the Premier. Premier, for the past month, your party has been busy announcing plans to spend billions of dollars that we don't have. This will be the second year in a row that economic growth has been stagnant in our province and that your government's deficit will get larger instead of smaller. Premier, this is not the road to recovery. A government that spends within its means and puts the right economic conditions for growth in place gives confidence to business and investors alike. Every other province in Canada understands that. So far, six have balanced their books, including the federal government. Tim Hudak and the PCs have a plan to get Ontario back on track. It's called our Million Jobs Plan. Premier, if you Order. The uh, member from Glengarry Prescott Russell will come to order. Carry on, please. Premier, if you don't have a plan of your own, will you at least adopt ours? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. the door for me to make a comment now. Instead of asking for quiet, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. And uh, my intention is to start right away. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I will give you this. You have a slogan. That is true. There is a slogan on the other side of the House, Mr. Speaker, but what that slogan masks is that what the opposition, what the uh, Conservatives would do, Mr. Speaker, is they would actually cut jobs. They would actually cut education. They would actually cut health care, Mr. Speaker. They would not invest in infrastructure, and they would not partner with business, Mr. Speaker, in order to bring those jobs to Ontario. So what we are going to do, and I, uh, I look forward to the response when the uh, budget is introduced this afternoon, is we are going to build the province, Mr. Speaker. Our plan believes in the, op in the opportunity in this province and believes in the possibility of more jobs coming to the province because we've demonstrated that can happen. We've demonstrated Answer. that making those investments actually is what we need in order to grow the economy. Right. Thank, you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, when the finance minister comes in here this afternoon in his new shoes, I hope they're chest waders because he's going to need them to get through that river of red ink that you're creating. Premier, you are driving business out of our province with your anti-growth and pro-special interest agenda. Increasing the cost of doing business is undermining our ability to compete and crippling our recovery. The PC party has a different approach. We've developed a job plan that will give every business an incentive to grow and be successful, not just your chosen few that were already succeeding without your handouts. We're calling for lower corporate taxes, lower energy rates, reduced red tape, more trade with our neighbours, and more trains still trade positions to a, a, a meet the need of Ontario. That's our plan. We won't ignore the problem and hope that it will go away. Premier, you have no credible plans to your own. I ask you one more time, will you adopt our plan? Please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, a plan that is really the right to work for less, Mr. Speaker, that is not. That is not here. We believe that we believe that having a highly skilled workforce is absolutely a foundation of our economic future, Mr. Speaker, and what they would do is they would actually cut the knees out from under the education system. They would fire education workers. They would, they would undermine the education system, Mr. Speaker. So we're not, we're not going to do that. I want to just from take Leeds, the member off come to order. another thing that he said. He talked about the, uh, the federal government being able to balance their budget. And I, Mr. Speaker, I hope that he's paying very close attention this afternoon, because one of the reasons that our revenues are in trouble, Mr. Speaker, is because the federal government has treated Ontario differently than every other
Minister of Energy will come to order. The, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London will come to order. That was hard to do. Final supplementary. The blame game. I know you're good at Premier. Will you? I, I get it. You won't take our plan. Would you agree to at least take a couple sessions of credit counseling? <laughs> it might be helpful. Today, you have an opportunity to change directions, to finally start climbing out of the hole you've created instead of digging deeper. Our million jobs Minister plan will natural resources of business, will come to order. investors, and credit rating agencies. It's about time that Ontario move back to its rightful place, at the head of the pack, leading this confederation being the economic engine of Canada once again. It's clear that you have no plan and will only take us down the road to higher employment and deepening debt. Even Quebec Premier Couliard gets it. He understands that the only way to restore confidence in his province is to get their fiscal house in order. Premier, we need to do that here. Will you change Question. direction today? Start moving Ontario out of the hole instead of growing deeper and deeper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with the member opposite that we need to be leaders in Confederation, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Ontario is a very, very important component of, uh, of this great country of ours, which is why, Mr. Speaker, it would be it would be terrific if the federal government treated Ontario in the same way that it treats every other province, Mr. Speaker. But having said that, having said that, we understand. That being fiscally responsible is Member from Burlington, we understand come to order, that making please. sure that we grow the economy and making sure that we work with business, partner with business. And I would ask the uh, member opposite to ask Open Text and Chrysler what they think about their plan to yeah. back away from partnership with business, Mr. Speaker. We believe that working with business and being a partner with business, as we are a partner with labour, that that is the way. Answer. That is the way to make sure that the investments in this province are made and jobs. Come to the province, which leads to the future growth. Thank you. Your question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, we took the time to introduce uh, first responders. Uh, I now want to take the time to thank them uh, for being here. We've invited them to celebrate first responders. It's really a celebration of our first responders. Speaker, I also want to thank the Premier and the Leader of the Official Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party and every member in this House for supporting Bill 15, which made this proclamation possible. And without uh, the unanimous consent of this Legislature, this would not have happened. And so it's great that we can come together. Now comes the tough question for the Premier. Immediately, immediately following the tribute uh, that we will give, uh, we will be gathering in the front of the legislature to take a commemorative photograph with all MPPs and our first responders. My question to the Premier is this. Will you join us for that picture? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I would be happy to join. Want to, first of all, I would just want to take a moment to tell the member opposite that no one knew what your question was going to be, and everyone was a little, what's, where's he going? <laughs> but you had spoken to me earlier, and I appreciate that. Um, I want to acknowledge the first responders who are here, and I want to thank them so much for what they do every single day. They walk into danger, they go out of their doors, and they don't know what they are going to find. So thank you very, very much. And I was, you know, I 
I was, uh, I was in a, a fire hall yesterday making an announcement with uh, my colleagues uh, about uh, adding uh, six more cancers to the list of uh, presumptive, uh, like, <laughs> presumptive, presumptive diseases. And you know, uh, you know, the 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 reality is, it doesn't matter where good ideas come from, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't matter because it was the right thing to do. And I just want to thank our firefighters. And all Thank you, Premier. That was the best answer you've given uh, in the 18 years that I've been here. Uh, speaker, uh, speaking of first responders, uh, the first responders in our air ambulance service have been under much discussion in this place over the last number of months, and I want to pay a special tribute to them for the service that they are performing in our province. So, Speaker, after two years of public hearings into the air ambulance scandal, the Public Accounts Committee signed off yesterday on a summary report after some 147 hours of testimony and 85 witnesses. And uh, we now look forward to seeing that report tabled. Question. Uh, we believe it will be tabled on Monday, subject to what happens here. Regardless of the timing of an election, will the Premier commit Thank you. that that report will be tabled? Mr. Speaker, you know, I am um, looking to the, the government House Leader because I don't want to, uh, to say something that would be with outside, outside the, the bounds of the protocols, but from my perspective, it's important that we all see what's in that report and that we find a way to, uh, to make sure that it is shared. So uh, I will make that commitment with the, only with the caveat that uh, we, have to, we have to follow all of the, uh, the rules and as, as, at the first opportunity that we would, uh, we would get it tabled, absolutely. I also wanted to just uh, note, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the uh, Mississauga first responders who were injured in last week's fire and uh, explosion deserve our thoughts, uh, our particular thoughts and prayers today. Absolutely. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the reason that I ask that question uh, to the Premier uh, is that two years of very hard work and I want to commend my colleagues on that committee of all parties. I believe that the work that that committee has done uh, has Order, produced please. a report that will be very important not only to the Ministry of Health but to every other ministry in the government. And we don't want to see that report in any way somehow not see the light of day. So notwithstanding the timing of an election. We know that if an election is called typically and that report has not yet been tabled, it would never see the light of day. It is possible for us to agree together that regardless of that timing, that report will be made public. Will the Premier, without Question. any qualification, make that commitment to us today? Uh, government House Leader. <laughs> government House Leader. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, this afternoon the Minister of Finance is going to be presenting a budget which I anticipate will enjoy the support of this legislature, Mr. Speaker. And our intention, Mr. Speaker, is to proceed both with debate around the budget and debate around legislation. And over the course of that, Mr. Speaker, certainly the committee, the report is in the hands of the committee. The chair of the committee will have an opportunity to uh, table uh, his report in the House, Mr. Speaker. And I, I think I speak for all members that we look forward to seeing the report and certainly the government will be responding to its contents. Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor to come Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Big day at Queen's Park. Speaker, on Tuesday, the Premier said that the Minister's office staff was first briefed on safety and durability dur uh, regarding the girders on the Herb Gray Parkway on June 14, 2013. However, yesterday, the Premier, in speaking about the 12 meetings in which girders were on the agenda between December and June 2013, she said, the fact is those meetings took place. There was not sufficient information during that time period to make definitive recommendations on safety. Will the Premier tell us which statement is true? Were they talking about safety prior to June 14th, or weren't they? Because clearly safety was an issue. Question. Discussions in those meetings. 
Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have been through this for many days. You have said things that are so inaccurate that they were nothing more than an attempt, I think, to smear reputations. I'm still waiting for an apology, Mr. Speaker, from the member opposite. I met with my deputy minister again this morning, Mr. Speaker. I reviewed it with my deputy minister, who went back through her notes, and she confirmed again that there was no discussion of safety issues or were any issues raised with her or me. She also confirmed with me that in early June I approached her and I asked her to look into the matter, which she did promptly, came back, said there could be concerns, we should look into it further, which was the result of the June 19th meeting, which led to the independent Answer. review and the discovery in late August as a result of that review and testing that there was a problem. This is so crystal clear, Thank and you. I wonder what the motives Thank are you. when the— Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I too wonder what the motives are when I hear a response like that. There were 12 meetings held where the girders were discussed between December the 14th and when the Premier said the Minister's office staff was briefed on the safety, safety of the girders. Minister of Education. Yesterday, the Premier said there wasn't sufficient information to make definitive recommendations on safety. The Premier is saying two separate things. Either they were discussing the safety of the girders or they weren't. The evidence says they were. When will the Premier put public safety and accountability ahead of her political interest and come clean about our government's mismanagement on the largest infrastructure project in the history of the province. Thank you. Minister. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're back to NDP geography. Do you know, I get asked where the questions are every time we're close to an election. Yeah. This is nothing but an attack on myself, the member for Windsor West, and it's a thinly veiled political game, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The Deputy Minister has told you, sir, you're wrong. The project manager, sir, has told you you are inaccurate and wrong. Every engineer in two ministries has told you, sir, you're wrong. What you are saying is not accurate. It is so inaccurate, it is smearing my reputation, that of officials and people in Windsor. You owe my deputy, you owe the people of Windsor an apology, and I will have no I will have no truck with you until you stand up and apologize and be the honourable gentleman I think you are. Final supplementary. Speaker, methinks the minister protests too much. The premier has said there will be no cost passed on to the taxpayer. As we learned from the gas plant scandal, what this government says about costs can't be trusted. As time went by, the price tag went up. Will the premier keep her promise? on transparency and tell Ontarians the real cost and liabilities they're facing over the mismanagement of the Herb Gray Parkway. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my deputy ministers, my officials don't have the privilege to speak out. They are silenced because they are public servants. The professionals who work on this are silenced because they are that. There is from the interim manager of the project who says the problems are nothing one wouldn't expect with a large-scale project. Connector bearings are made tested by an MTO-approved manufacturer. He has said 17 times, I think, on the public record, there is not an iota of safety concern. There hasn't been any concerns were properly remediated. 
This isn't an attack on me, Mr. Speaker. This is interest in coming from the third party, smearing public servants and smearing the working people who built this project. He knows what he's saying is not true. One has to wonder why he keeps saying it, Mr. Speaker. There is only one motive when you are at difference with the facts, and that is attacking people's reputations who can't criticize you. That's tabloid journalism, and I never thought they'd practice that at the CBC, Mr. Speaker. In question, the member from Windsor-Picosi. Speaker, government correspondence shows the Ministry of Transportation did not want the girders to be installed until safety concerns were addressed and Ontario standards were met. On the other hand, Infrastructure Ontario wanted to press ahead regardless because they didn't want a one- or a two-month delay. My question is to the Premier. Knowing what the Premier knows now about the girders, does the Premier have confidence in the way Infrastructure Ontario looked after the provincial interest? Premier. Premier. The question is directed to the Premier. Sorry, uh, I thought he's still on. Mr. Speaker, again, I would ask the member to apologize because what he just said. Hold on. Hold on. I'm hearing some things I don't like to hear, and it'll stop. So I can try this one more time, Mr. Speaker. It would be nice the next time you get one of those very generous briefings that my ministry staff have given you. And when you're sitting in that room, Mr. Speaker, you might want to apologize to them. Because your party is supposed to be concerned about working people. Your party is supposed to respect the integrity of the public service. That is certainly not consistent with what you're saying. You do not understand the difference between a compliance issue, as much as assistant deputy ministers and officials have explained this to you, that it's been in your own local paper. You continue to contradict them like you're some sort of expert. You're not, sir, an Answer. expert. You're out of your depth, and you're saying things that aren't accurate, and you're saying things that are hurting hurting people's reputations Thank you. that cannot answer your charge. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In a subsequent email to which I've just referenced, a senior vice president at Infrastructure Ontario suggests comments made by Fausto Natarelli, a man, by the way, Speaker, that I've known for many years, a public servant, a man of great integrity who I have great respect for. The Guy from Infrastructure Ontario says comments made by Mr. Natarelli are not productive. To which Natarelli says back to the VP at Infrastructure Ontario and responds with a quote, and I'll quote him, not engaging us fully so that we can effectively discharge our role in regards to provincial standards is not productive. Speaker. Why on earth did the Premier ever sign a contract that negotiated away the Ministry's ability to take immediate action to resolve any issue of public safety and warranty guarantees over the life expectancy of the construction materials on the Herb Gray Parkway? Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. Minister? Thank you. You know, I don't like to talk about individual members of the public service. We have a long tradition of not doing that. But I will tell you, I know the gentleman in question. And if you were doing your homework and you talked to him, ask him what his relationship with the minister was. And ask him what happened in that meeting on June 19th. Ask him. Because, Mr. Speaker, the statement the member from Windsor to Pepsi made just confirmed to me that he actually is saying things that, if he's talked to that, he knows even more that that's not true, Mr. Speaker. I find this offensive. I wish he would apologize. He continues to say things and quote people that, if he's actually talking to them, he knows that on June 19th, because that gentleman was in the room and he could tell you everything, sir, I am most profoundly disappointed that you don't Answer. actually come here with the accurate information that you should have. This project is safe. Thank you. Thank you. New question. Uh, sorry, final supplementary. You're right. Final supplementary. The correspondence I referenced was on February 14th, a long time before June 19th, Minister. 
Speaker, since this contract was signed in the Herb Gray Parkway, this government has authorized billions of dollars in other projects. The private contracts for these are modeled after the same contract Premier Wynn authorized on the troubled Herb Gray Parkway. If the Premier refuses to answer questions on the mismanagement of the Herb Gray Parkway, how can we trust or how can the people in this province trust her to lead the province's transit and infrastructure file? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, this is a great project and a great opportunity for the people of Windsor. The memos that, that frontline staff made, I have read every one of. Every single one I have read, but I read them after I was advised there was a problem. And the gentleman will tell you that. And the gentleman will tell you he has pretty great things to say about this minister, quite frankly, sir, and you know that. My deputy, my deputy does not. Finish, please. Thank you. And the reason I know that, Mr. Speaker, is because Mr. Natarelli was appointed by me and the deputy to oversee the project from that point of June 19th on. That's why I know, because he's he and I worked very closely on this project all last summer. And I believe you know that because he was the first person to come in an interim oversight. Yes, sir. And it was his work that helped us do that. And he will tell you the first time he talked to me about that was on June 19th. First time. He will tell you that. Thank That's you. why I know this project is safe, Mr. Sir. Thank you. No, new question. The member from Kitchener comes over. Yes, uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last year you chose to vote against the Fair and Open Tendering Act, which would have stopped the region of Waterloo from becoming locked into a construction monopoly. At the time, you excused your inaction by saying the region could apply to the Labour Board to become a non-construction employer. But I told you a year ago that that application process was broken. Well, guess what? The Labour Board rejected the region's application recently because, wait for it, it fixed the toilet handle at an addiction centre and installed a sign at a bus terminal. Wow. Premier, will you actually show some leadership today, admit you were wrong, and agree to fix the Labour Relations Act so that we can That's guarantee open tendering for public here, here. employers? Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question. I do understand that the Ontario Labour Relations Board has made a few preliminary decisions in this regard, dealing with the Carpenters' Union and the Regional Municipality of Waterloo. We received the most recent decision, and the Ministry is in the process of reviewing it right now. But, Speaker, as you know, the OLRB is an independent quasi-judicial tribunal. There's outstanding issues with respect to this matter that are currently before the board. It would be inappropriate for me to comment on the specifics of this case, but, Speaker, it's important to note that a municipality, if they are unsatisfied with the ruling of the OLRB, with the board's decision, they're able to reapply for classification as a non-construction employee here, here. at any time, Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Okay. Again to the Premier. Premier, if you fail to take action on this file, thousands of tradespeople will be barred from working on publicly funded infrastructure in Waterloo Region. Premier, I hope you're listening to this because it will be an election issue in our region and across the province. So you should at least respect should my taxpayers listen, in the community and listen to this question. I don't know about you, but I know I can speak for those of us on our side of the House when I say that closed tendering is unfair, unjust, and flat out wrong. Sure is. The vast majority of Ontarians believe that every quality qualified company and workers should have the right to bid and work on public infrastructure. That's why open tendering has the support of unionized contractors, open shop companies and municipalities from across the province. So Premier, listen. No you're not. 
I will ask you again. Will you show some courage, admit you're wrong, and agree to fix the labour relations Question. so that we can guarantee open tendering for public employers? Thank you. Minister. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I do thank the, uh, the member for the supplementary. And once again, I will note that if a municipality is unsatisfied with a board's decision at any time, they have the right to reapply. Others have done that in the past. We've got some non construction employers. Classification was granted, for example, to the Windsor Essex Catholic School Board, right. the independent electricity system operator. But what I really want to concentrate on my answer, Speaker, is how did these rules get in place? Where did they come from? Who bought these rules into, into place? Who? The Who? rulings that are being made by the OLRB in this case are based on rules that were bought in by the official opposition themselves oh! and refined further again by the official opposition again. So if you made a mistake on the rules, Speaker, I, I, I can understand them being upset about this. It's their rules, Speaker. They made the rules. That's what's being voted on today. Thank you. Your question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, court documents allege that the Liberal cabinet ministers had their homes cleaned for free as part of an elaborate kick government kickback scheme for government cleaning contracts. Premier, which Liberal cabinet ministers had their homes cleaned for free as part of this kickback scheme? Premier. I just, Mr. Speaker, I know that um, I know that the government house leader will want to speak to this uh, from his ministry's perspective, but. Um the, the member needs to know that uh, our government took these, the allegations around this issue very seriously in uh, 2010, that there were irregularities. As soon as the OPS uh, discovered that there were irregular financial transactions, they initiated an internal audit, Mr. Speaker. The information gathered from uh, the audit was shared with the OPP. An, inf an investigation was launched. On December 20, 2010, the OPP laid charges against three government employees and an employee of a facility a management company, Mr. Speaker. Um, and the process the was shared with the public uh, in an open OPP uh, news release on December 20, 2010. So, Mr. Speaker, this was uh, this was a police investigation that was dealt with and was drawn to uh, a legal conclusion. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you're right. It is another OPP investigation, which documents say that in fact. Uh, what happened was, as part of the scheme, Liberal cabinet ministers had their houses claimed for free. So I'm going to ask you the question yet again. Premier, which of your ministers or former ministers had their houses claimed for free? Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government Services. Mr. Speaker, I have, uh, I have great yeah, respect. The uh, Minister of Energy come to order and the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek come to order. As members are aware, I have great respect for the uh, House Leader of the NDP, but this is really out of character for him. This is really beneath him, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about a situation, Mr. Speaker, but that well, was the topic right. of uh, uh, media stories in 2010. There is absolutely nothing new here, Mr. Speaker. The individuals who uh, uh, undertook wrongdoing were charged. And, Mr. Speaker, let me read a quote from the OPP that was in the paper this morning. OPP Sergeant Carol Deon said the following. All of the names on the list were reviewed. There was no wrongdoing, no fraud, no criminal breach. Mr. Speaker, four individuals were charged. Anyone else, Mr. Speaker, that was somehow implicated or linked to this has yes, been sir? totally cleared, Mr. Speaker. There is nothing file. new here, and quite frankly, this is beneath the honourable member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. member from Glengarry, Prescott, Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Uh, Speaker, a number of weeks ago, I had the privilege and honour of having the Minister uh, come and visit the riding. We visited Ivaco, which is a major employer in uh, Lorignal, Ontario, and uh, we had announced an investment where we're going to help to uh, retain and create 458 jobs. We then uh, visited Alexandria Moulding in my hometown. Uh, so we visited and toured that facility, and we're helping them as well to uh, retain and create 353 jobs. We also made announcements, Speaker, further to that, to Montebello Packaging, where we're going to retain and create 86 jobs, and also Skodadakis Goat Farm, uh, a Greek, uh, Greek um, yogurt maker uh, that's growing right across the province, Mr. Speaker, in North America. We're helping to create and retain 110 jobs. Uh, so, Speaker, Minister, uh, I know last week you joined the Premier and Question. Mr. Roy. 
to announce a multi-billion dollar investment in other communities such as Kitchener and Waterloo. So I'm just asking if the minister could update us with the details of those announcements. For economic development, trade and uh, employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And last week, the members correct. I had the pleasure of joining the Premier and my colleague from Kitchener Centre to announce an unprecedented investment by Open Text, one of the world's largest and most successful technology companies, operating in 33 countries around the globe. Mr. Speaker, this is a significant partnership for the province. Open Text will be investing up to two billion dollars in, in its Ontario operations, making our province its R&D hub globally for cloud computing technology, the future of the internet. This is great news, Mr. Speaker. This partnership will create up to 1,200 new jobs, doubling the company's Ontario workforce, and these jobs will be high-paying ICT jobs. This investment is also going to pay great dividends to the province. Our $120 million investment will directly benefit the province with over $200 million in tax revenues alone. And most importantly, Mr. Speaker, this partnership will help to guarantee the success yes, of our sector, of this sector for years to come and keep Ontario at the forefront of the world's most exciting innovations. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that great news. Uh, the tech and manufacturing sectors in my riding and across the province will continue to benefit from our government's commitment to this sector because we're making smart, strategic partnerships with industry. This announcement demonstrates our plans to create jobs and grow the economy. But, Speaker, this government has many positive and successful measures we've taken to create good-paying jobs across this province, but the party opposite have come out with name-calling and harming the relationships we have with our industry partners. Speaker, I find it appalling that the leader of the official opposition actually calls our investments in our business and industries as corporate welfare. And as a matter of fact, the PC candidate in my ride in the Glengarry Prescott Russell said it was a shame that we gave a million dollars or partnered with a million dollars to St. Albert's Cheese uh, when, when we all know that St. Albert's went through some very difficult times over the last year. So, Speaker, Question. Uh, back to the Minister of Economic Deve uh, De Development and Trade and Economic uh, Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Can the Minister elaborate on how we're keeping Ontario Thank competitive you. in this sector? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, one of the key priorities for our government is creating good-paying jobs for today and tomorrow. And we've seen this with the landmark. $4 billion Cisco announcement last, uh, announced last December, the, and it's the province's talented workforce, our research infrastructure and competitive business climate that's attracting these top companies who are choosing to invest here as a result. And it's refreshing to know that some members from the party opposite are getting it, or at least former members, Mr. Speaker. To quote the former member from Thornhill, Peter Sherman, when he was asked why the government partnered with OpenText, he said it's necessary because, quote, we're in a competitive race. That's why. And the former PC finance critic went on to say, quote, there are things that even conservatives have to do. If we're going to get a $2 billion investment from a company that operates in 33 jurisdictions, that $120 million will alleviate any concerns of other jurisdictions coming to the fore. It's a good thing. And thank you. Thank you. The question, the member from Durham. Yes, thank you. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, yesterday, Mr. and Mrs. McEwen were here at Queen's Park, and my constituent, Jim McEwen, suffered a stroke in 2010 at the age of 55. He spent a few weeks in hospital and rehab, and on discharge, he asked the question, what's next? And he was told, you're done. Jim McEwen and his family have been paying, with their own money, thousands of dollars over the past four years to partake in post-stroke physiotherapy. Minister, you denied Mr. McEwen and other Ontario citizens OHIP-funded physiotherapy because of their age. This is simply wrong. Minister, in your Ontario today, post-stroke patients over 19 and under 65 are not entitled to OHIP-funded physiotherapy. This is shameful. Minister, will you address this discriminatory policy and provide OHIP-funded physiotherapy for all qualified post-stroke patients? Thank you. Minister of Health, Well, Speaker, this, this is a spend question, and we know very well that the member of the party opposite wants to cut spending. Speaker, we do have uh, services that are available to senior citizens, to people 65 and over, including drug benefits, for example. I'm wondering if the member opposite wants to extend drug, drug 
coverage to everyone as well, which I think would be a great idea but would cost some money. Speaker, when it comes to physiotherapy services, we do cover people 19 and over, from Renfrew, and, cover people Pembroke, second time. And, over, and we do cover people who have had a hospitalization. So, Speaker, we are expanding access to physiotherapy right across the province, including in the member opposite's own community. Speaker, we're expanding access to home-based physiotherapy, to clinic-based physiotherapy. This is absolutely Answer. a move in the right direction, providing better care for patients and better value for our money. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, Minister, my question is really a matter of fairness, and I wish you would put it in that context. Minister, I've petitioned you and written you over the past four years on this issue. This is about justice. Mr. McEwen was here yesterday with his wife, Lorraine. They are asking you for help to allow Mr. McEwen to receive OHIP-funded physiotherapy so he can return to work as a professional engineer and a productive member of society. Minister, will you address this on fairness issue and extend OHIP-funded physiotherapy to all qualified post-stroke patients, not based on discrimination of age under over 19 and under 65? Will you do this today? It's about fairness. Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I am delighted to know that the PC caucus now ex supports the expansion of, of health care services. Everything you talk about is about cutting services. And when we took the move, Speaker, to expand services to people through reforms in physiotherapy, the members opposite opposed our expansion of physiotherapy. They opposed the expansion of exercise programs and false prevention programs for people of this province. We are making investments to keep people healthier and out of hospital, and I'm delighted to know you're now with us on that. Your question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The cost of electrifying the GO Line from Kitchener to Waterloo to Toronto is pegged at $900 million, and the cost of two-way all-day GO services is estimated at nearly $5 billion. But your minister claims that he can deliver 200-kilometer train routes with bullet trains at 320 kilometers an hour at the bargain basement price of $500 million, the same cost as a 36-kilometer BRT route from Scarborough to Durham. After years of turmoil in transit, in transportation, in infrastructure, people in this province deserve honest numbers. Does the Premier think this is a credible promise? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, uh, I know that the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure is going to want to speak to the details of the plan, but I want to just say to the member opposite that I think this is a very exciting plan. I think that it is necessary, and I know that the I know that the member opposite has been at announcements and been at events in her community where she has heard from people, particularly in the high tech community, who very much want that connectivity between the Kitchener Waterloo, the Waterloo region, and the GTHA, Mr. Speaker. That is exactly what they are looking for. And I hope that the the question, which at least is a question about investment in the future and in transit. I hope that it indicates that the uh, party opposite will take a very close look at the budget when we bring it in, because those investments in transit and in transportation infrastructure are core Answer. to our plan for economic growth in the province. I look forward to their support, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplement. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. <laughs> Madam Premier, it is the best plan in the galaxy because <laughs> what Liberals will promise, what we know what they'll promise, they'll promise anything and everything to get elected. In order to save a few Liberal seats, you chant, you, uh, you, in the GTA, you promised to cancel gas plants, and it said you said it would cost nothing. But we know the truth now. Now they're worried about seats and Minister of Citizenship, come to order. making a promise for a bullet train that, to quote the minister, will cost five hundred million dollars after revenue over the next 10 years. The proposed HS2 high-speed train in the United Kingdom will run half the number of trains, but it will cost $29 billion. That's a difference of 5,800%. Is, is the Premier saying to Ontarians that they are going to feel that's nearly 6,000% better than the one in the United Kingdom? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. And I, I, great, I greatly appreciate what I think is a very honest question from the member, and I'm happy to answer the question. 
There are two projects here. There are two projects here. There is the Regional Express Rail project, which is the two-way all-day go service being run by Metrolinx, which will run to Guelph and run to Kitchener. Those are electrified trains running every 15 minutes. Much of that expenditure has already been absorbed. I think we own 80 percent of the track, and Metrolinx is now working on that. That's part of the Metrolinx program. The study, it is not my numbers. I, I'm not an expert at this. They're not my numbers. The numbers are uh, the numbers, Mr. Speaker. Well, you want the answer, then listen. I'll give you the answer right now. She has a right to an answer. The estimates from FCP, from Britain, who designed that, world-leading experts, uh, first-class partnership, is that it is a project that will cost in the two to three billion dollars to upgrade to London and Thank to you. add that track and net of revenues. Thank net of you. Thank you. New question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I am uh, particularly uh, happy to rise on this First Responders Day to uh, ask this particular question to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, yesterday I had the pleasure of attending an announcement with the Premier, the Minister of Labour and the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, at which we announced that we would be extending protections for firefighters across Ontario. Speaker, as you may know, last May I brought forward Bill 81. I brought, I brought forward Bill 81, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Amendment Act, presumptive for firefighters, which called for the government to add six additional cancers to the existing eight that are to be presumed to be work-related by the WSIB. Speaker, this is an issue that's very important to the members of my local firefighters association in Vaughan, and it's something that I've worked closely with, uh, with current President Jason McInnes and former President Mike Doyle on. Speaker, Question. through you to the minister, can you please speak further to this new regulation? Thank you, Speaker. I'd be very, very happy to. But first, let me thank all the first responders that have joined us at Queen's Park today and all across this great province. And I'd particularly like to thank the member from Vaughan, not only for this question in the House today, but for his excellent advocacy on this issue over the past months. We know that everyday firefighters risk their lives to protect us and our communities. We've got to protect them in, in return. We're building on the eight cancers that we already presume and we're making it even easier for full-time, part-time, volunteer here. firefighters and fire and get investigators to qualify for benefits. Here, here. Our new regulation applies retroactively to January 1, 1960. It's going to immediately add breast cancer, multiple myeloma, testicular cancer to the list, and with an additional three to be phased in, prostate cancer in 2015, lung cancer in 2016, skin cancer in 2017. Speaker, this is the right thing to do. I was so proud to be a part of that yesterday. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his response and for being there yesterday with, uh, with all of the folks who were at the announcement. Speaker, there are approximately 450 fire departments in the province of Ontario, made up of about 11,000 full-time firefighters, 19,000 volunteer firefighters, and 200 part-time firefighters. I am very, very thrilled to be a member of a government that is working hard to protect these vital members of our communities. This expanded list of presumptive illnesses will make a huge difference in the lives of firefighters in Ontario's, across Ontario, lifting the burden of proof from their backs uh, when they need it most. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please tell us a bit more about the regulation and what our government is doing to further protect firefighters in Ontario? Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again for the question to my colleague. Uh, this regulation recognizes the years of service of firefighters. It makes Ontario one of the leading jurisdictions in all of Canada. And you know, Speaker, it lit up the Twitterverse last night. While we were standing by these courageous men and women, the PC candidate in Eglinton Lawrence was tweeting that firefighters in this province are a special interest group that can be bought. Oh. While the PCs were busy denigrating heroic firefighters across social media last night, let's hear what the firefighters themselves had to say. Mark McKinnon, president of the association, applauded our move, said it's going to allow firefighters and their families to focus on getting better instead of struggling to get WICB benefits for an illness that could have been contracted years earlier. John Sobey, vice president of the Ottawa Firefighter Association, these things take time. Good things come to those who wait. We're most happy for the families of the fallen firefighters. This side of the House, Speaker, we respect the life-saving work of Ontario's firefighters. Hey, here. Can you see that, please? Can you see that, please? 
Thank you. New question. The member from Dufferin Calgary. My question is to the Minister of Environment. Since a transformer was installed in 2006 to service industrial wind turbines in my community, residents have been trying to get numerous issues resolved, including noise and health concerns. Residents and the municipality have been regularly reporting these issues to the MOE Spills Action Centre. Do you agree that one of your responsibilities as the Minister of Environment is to resolve issues related to environmental concerns, including monitoring emissions from transformer stations through the Spills Reporting Centre? Uh, our ministry, of course, works very hard to resolve all issues which are of an environmental nature, including the issues that are right across the province of Ontario. They may relate to air quality, they may relate to uh, noise, they may relate to uh, water quality, and I know that ministry officials work very hard to resolve these matters. Uh, there are times when people are going to be in disagreement with whatever results are achieved at that, and I certainly respect the fact that some people are not going to agree with conclusions that are reached. And so we have these mechanisms in place for people to access the Ministry of the Environment in order that they may deal as expeditiously as possible with these issues within the uh, legislation, within the regulations, with the poli within the policy precepts of the province of Ontario. So, uh, certainly, our ministry strives to be uh, very helpful to the people of this province, and I'm sure that they will continue to Thank do you. so well into the future. Great answer. I'm glad the minister understands his responsibilities, but I don't understand why the Whitworth family has been told by your ministry that their concerns are irrelevant uh -oh. and they don't care about their issues. On one occasion, when the Whitworths asked how they could lodge a formal complaint, they were, quote, and I quote, the ministry has closed your file and will not be taking any action on your complaints and that no other agency, department or ministry are taking any steps to address or assume responsibility. Your government has turned their backs on the Whitworths. My, my question, Minister, is simple. How, now that you've decreed that the Whitworths file is closed, where do you expect this family to go for resolving their issues? Well, I, I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that there are going to be, I think, as I alluded to in my initial response, that there are going to be people who are going to be ultimately disagreeing with the conclusions that are reached by uh, not only the Ministry of the Environment but other ministries, when, particularly when the uh, particular assertions have been made on many occasions and responses have been given. I recognize as well that people are not always going to be happy with the response. They will get a response and they will continue to pursue issues, as is their right to pursue issues. Exactly. However, uh, there, there will come a time from time to time where the answer that the ministry has given is an answer that, unless there's new information which is provided, unless there's additional information that's provided, the ministry will order, please. The ministry will ensure that uh, it gives the appropriate uh, answers. I know there are other mechanisms yes, that are available, but I must say, Mr. Speaker, we do reach this circumstance, and former environment ministers who sat on the other side of the Thank house you. would fully understand that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Primary Gorbachev. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Long-term construction projects kicked off this week on the Gardner Expressway, resulting in lane restrictions until 2016. Families will see their commute times increase dramatically in the GTA, with no access to viable transit alternatives. We should be making Brampton into a transit hub, but the minister can't even deliver two-way all-day go service. Why is the minister content to continue the Liberal record of delay, delay when, the Brampton, when Brampton needs transit relief now? Um, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I hope the member knows that the, uh, that the uh, Gardner is a municipal infrastructure run by the city, of which I think his party has a large number of members, so I'm hoping he's in, uh, in discussion with his municipal caucus friends at Toronto City Hall. Uh, as someone who lives beside the Gardner, I would appreciate and I wish him well in those discussions because I live a half a block from the Gardner and the Lakeshore, which for some peculiar reason and some act of brilliant transportation were both closed at the same time, which uh, has created some 
some interesting discussions in my neighbourhood. We, we have a $50 billion investment in the big move. The Premier just announced an additional unprecedented $29 billion fund. We're extending the 427, the 407. We're making massive investments in rapid transit in, in Viva with York and, and with the other regions. I hope the party will support the budget later today Answer. because this is a historic, unprecedented level. And if the member does have those concerns, which I take him at his value, I hope he'll be rising with Thank us you. several times in the next few days. As my constituents and I can attest, construction on the Gardiner has increased commute times by almost an hour. People need a viable alternative. We hear lots of empty promises from the Liberals, but there's still really no funding for all-day two-way GO service. The government has delayed important transit improvements in Mississauga and Brampton for too long. Why won't the minister commit to timelines and start the funding for these projects that Brampton needs, rather than spending his time making flashy announcements that Ontarians simply cannot trust? Um, Mr. Speaker, we have a, a $50 billion plan, which we are about $17 billion into, and we're about five years of the 25 years. If you do the math, $17 billion of $50 billion commitment at about year five means we're way ahead of schedule. And we're now building more rapid transit capital projects, including in your community, and, than ever before. It's unprecedented. This isn't announcements. These are results and actions that are going on right now across the province. We'd like to complete this project because right now the last premier who spent as m invested as much in rapid transit and transportation was George Drew, and he left office in 1969. And, you know, and we went through a 35-year drought where we never spent more than three or four billion dollars. We spent more than that on highways alone, Mr. Speaker. So we're back at two percent of GDP. We think we share some views, we hope we do, with the, with the NDP on the importance of infrastructure. Thank I you. guess we'll find out when the budget gets voted on if that's true. No question. The member from the Mark. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Care, the Honourable Deb Matthews. I'd like to welcome to Parliament my colleagues, fellow members of the Ontario Medical Association, who are here in force for the annual Doctors' Day. <laughs> Speaker, today is an ideal time for us to recognize the thousands of physicians across Ontario who screen, test, diagnose, examine, palpate, auscultate, prescribe, monitor, advise, console, and heal us through hundreds of illnesses, through the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Speaker, it's been said that medicine is the most scientific art and the most artistic science. I know firsthand that Ontario physicians mobilize this wisdom every day. I know their dedication and commitment and energy and compassion. Speaker, my question is this. Minister, would you please share with this chamber some of your thoughts on how you value question. doctors, not merely the ones in caucus, but those across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I certainly do value all doctors, including the three in our caucus, indeed the three in this legislature. Speaker, I welcome uh, the OMA today. We're delighted to be celebrating uh, Doctors' Day here, and I want to say a big uh, congratulations to Dr. Dave Tandon, the 133rd president of the OMA, and. Um, Acknowledge the extraordinary work of Dr. Scott Wooder, who is the uh, past president now of the OMA. Speaker, we have 26,000 doctors working in uh, this province. They play a very central role, of course, in uh, any attempt to reform our health care system. I'm pleased to say that Ontario's doctors have been great partners and even more delighted that Dr. Tandon has made a priority of his presidency building stronger partnerships and building stronger bridges. So thank you for that, Doctor. Speaker, as we have worked to increase access to physicians across the Answer. province, doctors have been there with us. As, as we've shifted our focus to patient-centered interdisciplinary care teams, doctors have been there with us. Thank you. And they've been there with us. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your thoughts as well as your endorsement. Uh, speaker, as you'll appreciate, doctors are committed to high-quality, timely, and accessible patient care in communities across Ontario. Primary care physicians, in particular, are the gatekeepers and goaltenders of our health care system. Epidemics of cardiometabolic disease, type 2 diabetes, adult and childhood obesity, osteoarthritis, respiratory ailments like asthma and COPD, cancers, 
All these land on the desks of Ontario's family doctors. It is the family docs who must play the lead role in encouraging patients to live healthier lives, avoid disease triggers, and monitor themselves. Family docs are generally the first point of contact in the healthcare system when patients fall ill. Yet I know, Speaker, there are many families in my own riding of Etobicoke North who are concerned about access to primary care. Speaker, would the minister please elaborate on her efforts at increasing equitable access Question. to doctors and communities across Ontario? Thank you. Uh, yes. Speaker, thank you. And, uh, the member's right. We've made great efforts to train and recruit more doctors in Ontario and ensure that their services are available in the communities that need them. I'm delighted to say that we have nearly 4,000 more doctors working in this province than we did just a decade ago. Our family health teams are providing care to over 3 million people. Speaker, we've created the Health Force Ontario's Northern and Rural Recruitment and Retention Fund, so there are more physicians attracted to small and northern communities where they are often most needed. In 2009, we launched Healthcare Connect. It's, it's helped a quarter of a million people who do not have a family doctor find one. There is more to do. I do want to say thank you to the doctors for supporting us as we've uh, focused on, on wellness and prevention, as we've proposed uh, uh, legislation like the Skin Cancer Protection Act, the Youth Smoking Prevention Act, the Making Healthier Choices Act. Ontario doctors have been right there thank with you. us supporting. Thank you. The new question, the member from Wellington, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Will the Premier explain to the House why the government cancelled the Connecting Link program, an historic partnership so vitally important to our municipalities like the Township of Centre Wellington and the Town of Halton Hills, without adequate notice or consultation? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, we actually have just done the MIIII and the Small Rural and Northern programs, which is $100 million. The Premier just announced an unprecedented four, over $14 billion fund for rural and northern Ontario. My estimate, in any year since we've been in government, we have been spending $5 to $10 more uh, than you did per person uh, in rural Ontario. And we are working now and have had consultants to integrate all of those highways. The other thing, Mr. Speaker, as you know, you downloaded 42 percent of the highways in eastern Ontario and took all the provincial highways and downloaded health and social service just in case there was any chance that any municipal leader could find five cents for it. We are uploading health and social services and we are putting more money into rural roads and highways. So I'm hoping that that statement from my honourable friend that uh, you'll be supporting the budget uh, and you'll see that as some redemption yes, for your government's record, which I'm sure from your lips to God's ears will give us both a place in heaven, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Member from First Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, nobody believes the minister anymore. No. Uh, to the premier, by cancelling this historic partnership, the minister, the premier, is asking rural Ontario to pay the price for liberal mistakes. Yep. West Perth needs a, to reconstruct the, uh, the Blanchard Bridge at a cost of about 1.7 million dollars. Wellington North needs over a million dollars to repair the Rick Hopkins Bridge. These are provincial bridges on provincial highways carrying provincial traffic. Speaker, I'll ask the Premier to, to use her math skills. How many times could this government have fixed our bridges if it hadn't blown over a billion dollars and cancelled gas plants? Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, this new, these new funding initiatives that are several fold what the pre party in power started when Premier Wynne was Minister of Transportation through, uh, through Roma and through the Ontario Good Roads Association. We started these new programs. They were written in partnership, and we very carefully listened to rural leaders across Ontario. As a matter of fact, the government has been so principled that over 86 percent of all the funds in these programs go to opposition writings. <laughs> And so I don't understand. I would hope that the person opposite, if the member from Perth Wellington is so concerned about this, he might want to apologize to those rural leaders for all the downloading of health and social services and when you took all the provincial highways and dumped them on municipalities. We are uploading and we have a fully funded program, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and in the budget you will see the continuing growth of that commitment, Mr. Speaker. I hope that means the member from Perth Wellington has mended his ways and that his party will join us in supporting the budget, Thank Mr. You. Speaker.
We have a deferred vote on the motion of Mr. Malloy and that the question be now put on the motion to second reading of Bill 141, an act to enact the Infrastructure for Jobs and Prosperity Act 2013. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
All members take your seats, please. All members take your seats, please. We have a deferred vote on the motion. Mr. Malloy has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour, rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk, please. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Ms. Sandler. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Jassic. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolinot. Madame Jolinot. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishaw. Mr. Nadishaw. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Europe. Mr. Europe. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. The ayes being 59 and the nays being 32, I declare the motion carried. On December the 5th, on December the 5th, 2013, Mr. Murray moved second reading of Bill 141. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Second reading of the bill. Second reading of the bill gives you much pleasure to watch. Shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. I, I would ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Regulations and Private Bills, Mr. Speaker. So ordered. At this time, we are fulfilling a unanimous consent to give tribute to our first responders. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm honored to rise on behalf of uh, Tim Hudak, leader of the official opposition, and my colleagues uh, in the PC caucus. Uh, and I know that uh, I'll be joined by uh, my colleagues here unanimously. I had the uh, privilege of bringing this bill forward. And as members know, it was a complex process. 
Uh, what uh, is, however, very encouraging is that ultimately this bill was passed because unanimously we as members agreed that it was the right thing to do. It's appropriate that we would take a day uh, when we would recognize the contribution that uh, first responders make to our communities. There will be a memorial this weekend and we will remember first responders who died in the course of fulfilling their duties. And I've participated, as many members have over the last uh, number of years. I now will have served June 9th, if we get there, uh, for 19 years. And, and I know there are some members who are pleased to know that I'm moving on. Uh, but thank you, Minister of Health. But. Over that time, uh, I have had the honor to participate in those uh, memorials. But what is important to me, and I believe all of us, is that we not only remember first responders who have died in carrying out their responsibilities, but that we remember them while they are with us and carrying on those responsibilities, yeah. that we celebrate what you do and we're appreciative of what you do. And that's what this bill does. Uh, the purpose of the legislation is so that we would raise awareness within our community, starting here, as we're doing now, uh, as members of the legislature, to give honor and respect and celebrate. Uh, and the objective was that throughout this province, that whether at municipal level or whether in our schools and auditoriums, throughout our communities, that we would come together, people would come together, pause, take this day and say, thank you. We appreciate what you do for us. Uh, we appreciate the safety and security that we enjoy uh, in our communities. That doesn't just happen by accident. But, Speaker, we often take for granted uh, these important services and the dedication, not only of the first responders, but of their families as well. Not an easy task to day in and day out. Uh, put yourself in harm's way for the protection uh, of people within our communities. And so we're here uh, celebrating that contribution. One of the initiatives that uh, I undertook to try to spread that news was to initiate an essay contest in our schools. Contacted both school boards um, uh, in uh, Newmarket and Aurora and York Region and asked uh, to have students participate and write an essay to say what first responders mean to them and to our communities. And I'd like to read into the record one of those uh, essays that uh, was received because I believe that this really goes to the heart of what we're trying to achieve with this day. It's entitled Heroes by Tatiana Pancho, grade 11, Sacred Heart Catholic High School. In 2009, I had a brain aneurysm which led to a stroke. I had a bleed on the right side of my brain. I was left side paralyzed and had to learn how to walk and talk all over again. I was with my father when I felt a weakness in my knees. My hero, my father, a Toronto police officer, went into emergency mode. His actions saved my life. He called 911 and the emergency medical services unit came out. My heroes, the ambulance attendants, were quick and thorough. They got me to the hospital, by which time I was in a coma. My heroes, the emergency staff, doctors, nurses, and administrative team worked diligently to ensure my safety. The doctors requested air transport to the sick kids. Organizing this would take three to six hours. My dad, Superman to me, called his unit. His unit command called York Regional Police, and they came to his rescue, my rescue. They blocked traffic and got me to sick kids with moments to spare. I was then rushed into surgery. My heroes, the doctors and nurses at Hospital for Sick Children. My heroes, the police officers who keep us safe, firefighters who are not only there if there is a fire, but are called out to motor vehicle accidents to assist with the jaws of life or simply to get your pet out of a tree. The EMS team who works against time to get patients to the hospital. 
the administrative staff in hospital, the first contact in a hospital visit, the doctors and nurses who fight the odds constantly to ensure survival. I am here to tell my story because of the amazing work of first responders. First responders, 911 operators, police, fire, ambulance, my heroes. I want to thank Titania for her essay and her insight. And in closing, Speaker, I want to give a very special recognition to someone who was very instrumental uh, in me bringing this bill forward, and that is Valise Stone, uh, who is with us. I would ask her to stand. Valise <laughs> Stone is the author of a book entitled 911, True Tales of Courage and Compassion. And Valise came to my office and gave me that book. And uh, it, is, it recounts the stories of first responders uh, who Vali asked to share the most memorable times that they've had in carrying out their duties. I commend that book to all members. In fact, when I first introduced this bill, uh, I made that book available to all members here. Uh, I believe it's something that everyone in this province should read. Uh, again, uh, in closing, Speaker, I just want to express our sincere appreciation uh, to the work that our first responders do, and uh, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Our province and our communities are what they are because of the work that you do. Thank you. Next tribute, please. The Minister of Community Safety and Corrections. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, it is my great privilege to rise in this House today on behalf of our Premier, my colleagues in the Government Caucus, and the people of Ontario to recognize and express our gratitude to our first responders. Speaker, first responders provide emergency services in times of crisis. Every day, our first responders put their lives online to protect us, our friends, neighbors, and loved ones. They are there when we need them most and look after us in our time of need. We are always confident that Ontario's first responders are ready at moment's notice to protect our homes, businesses, and our communities. To recognize their ongoing commitment to community safety, the Ontario Legislature proclaimed May 1st of each year as First Responders Day. I especially want to thank Speaker, the member from Newmarket, Aurora, for championing this very important initiative. Speaker, first responders include police officers, firefighters, military personnel, paramedics, medical evacuation pilots, dispatchers, nurses, doctors, and emergency managers. It also includes the many volunteers and professionals who dedicate their careers to the service of others. Emergency service pro providers are important members of our communities. They are also our neighbors, friends, and relatives. Speaker, I'm very proud to note that my late grandfather, Ghulam Abbas Nakwi, was a police officer. Our first responders help people in times of crisis, but we also want to recognize their volunteer work, which helps strengthen our communities. From charity events, toy drives, community car washes, and coaching Little League, our first responders are a positive example for our youth and to everyone in our communities. I was pleased to join Premier Wen and Minister Kevin Flynn and MPP Stephen Del Duca yesterday to announce that our government is improving supports for firefighters across Ontario. We're increasing cancer coverage to make it easier for firefighters with cancer associated with their work to qualify for workplace insurance benefits. It's the right thing to do to help protect those who protect us. Speaker, we know that Ontario families and communities are safer thanks to the dedication of our first responders who are there to help us when we need them most. They make a difference every day in communities across our great province. They help us feel safe and protect us against during emergency situations. 
I also want to recognize the sacrifice of their families, their partners, their mothers and fathers, and their children. Thank you for sharing your loved ones with us and putting them in line of harm. Speaker, we also want to take the opportunity to pay our respect to those who have lost their lives in the line of duty. Working with firefighters and police, we created an annual tribute to honor those who have died in the line of duty. This weekend, the Ontario Police Memorial Foundation will hold its annual ceremony of remembrance at Queen's Park here in Toronto. The names of fallen officers are inscribed on the wall of honor. Let's all take a moment to reflect on their courage and dedication. Speaker, heroes are defined by the way they live their lives, serving their communities and protecting those in harm's way. To the families of those who have given their lives to protect others, we owe you an eternal debt and we keep the memory of your loved ones in our hearts and minds so that they may be never forgotten. Ontarians are privileged to be protected by our first responders. We are grateful for their dedication, for their public service, and their commit commitment to duty and service. Thank you. Merci. Final tribute, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's an honour and a privilege to stand in the company of such heroes here today. And certainly, on behalf of Andrea Horvath and the entire New Democratic Party caucus, uh, the most important words we can say to you today are thank you. Uh, and certainly, it was in that spirit that our leader, Andrea Horvath, uh, first tabled the bill about presumed diagnosis for certain varieties of cancer. And we are delighted that the government has picked up on that and brought that to, to bear and brought it into reality. That's a very good thing. As the Premier herself said, it doesn't matter where good ideas come from. Uh, certainly on February 27th, we in the NDP tabled a bill for presumed diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder for those who rush into danger when we rush out. This is critical. In fact, it's law in Alberta. It has been law in Alberta for over two years now. What they've discovered is there's no increase in the number of claims or cases. Just those claims and cases are dealt with with dignity. Uh, the way our first responders should be dealt with, with dignity, even when they succumb to post-traumatic stress disorder, which happens and which also results in death on occasion. Uh, they also found in Alberta that it doesn't cost any more. It doesn't cost any more for municipalities. And uh, these are facts based on evidence of actually working with the law for over two years now. Uh, on that day, we had in this house the Ontario Provincial Police Association, Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, Police Association of Ontario, the Ontario Paramedic Association, TEMA, OPSU, UNIFOR, QP and ATU, all in support of Bill 67. Uh, most notably, though, I think were the stories of the individuals who were suffering. Jeff Balch, firefighter. Bruce Kruger, Ontario Provincial Police Person. David Whiteley, paramedic, who came very brave individuals and told the stories of what it was to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, to try to get a claim through WSIB, and to often fail in that pursuit. We also heard from WSIB workers themselves who said they wished they had the tools to process these claims in a dignified and honourable way, rather than look for every excuse not to process them. Uh, so that is what this bill does. I believe that just like first responders would never say never to us in terms of protecting our safety, we should never say never to them. I don't believe for a moment, Mr. Speaker, that this is a partisan issue. I've heard uh, some negative rumblings uh, from uh, both the Liberals and the Progressive Conservatives, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that there's a person in this room. Order. I don't believe that there's a person in this room, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't want what's best for our first responders. And so it is in that spirit that I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice 
regarding Bill 67, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997 with respect to post-traumatic stress disorder. That was what I was thinking. I am, uh, if I could have your indulgence, please. I'm going to ask the member to, and I stop the clock, provide the rest of her statement. If she's finished, that's fine. And then I will entertain that after because we're in the middle of a unanimous consent to do the work that we're doing now. So if you would like to complete your statement. Absolutely. Uh, I just want to give credit where credit is due and say that it was the member from Newmarket Aurora who made the suggestion. Uh, when the reading happened uh, for Bill 67, it was his suggestion that it pass today on May 1st. But it was also the suggestion of hundreds of paramedics, firefighters, and police officers who also sent us their wishes that this pass today, including the unions that I, uh, that I enumerated. So uh, at, at, at this point, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to conclude my statements and then move unanimous consent. Thank you. Thank you. I thank, uh, I thank all members for their statements. Uh, we are now finished with that unanimous consent, and I will entertain the member from Parkdale High Park on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, I seek unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding Bill 67, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997 with respect to post-traumatic stress disorder. Ms. Novo has um, is seeking unanimous consent to move a motion without notice regarding Bill 67, an act to amend the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act 1997 with respect to post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Do we agree? No. I heard a no. There are no, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.